All right, well, welcome to our first Kansas Studies Institute of Academic Lecture for today. I'm Ty Edwards. I'm the director of the Kansas Studies Institute, but I should say my predecessor is Farrell Janaj, and it's really her fault that all these uh, talks are going on. She did all the work, uh, and now I'm here to take all the credit. So we will start with Dr. Daly. Dr. Daly is one of my colleagues here at JCCC. He's an anthropology professor, also the director for the Center of American Indian Studies and co-founder and associate director of the American Indian Health Research and Education Alliance, uh, which is a partnership with KU Med, right, and JCCC. And he has spent the majority of his career working with American Indian peoples and communities, as well as ranchers <coughs> in Arizona, Kansas, New Mexico, South Dakota, and Utah. And I just learned over the summer that your dissertation was about cowboys, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So we're getting back to uh, academic basics with you. <laughs> with this history. All right, so well, let's welcome Dr. Daly, and there will be about 30 minutes, and then there will be lots of time for questions at the end. So if you have lots of questions, Dr. Daly will be able to entertain those. Okay? All cool. right, take it away. Thank you. Can we kill the front you lights? Yeah. yeah, just the front. Yeah, that's how I do it too. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I'm going to apologize for the whimsical font. Uh, it was not whimsical on my computer, it was an old, <laughs> it was an old West font. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what difference there is between this computer and the one upstairs in my office in the same building, uh, but it was an Old West font. So I apologize for that. Out of my control. It happens. So who in here has been to a rodeo? Oh, wow, everyone. Who in here used to rodeo? All right, none of you guys. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the terminology, a rodeo is a Spanish word. Uh, it essentially means roundup in, in its origins. Uh, it's come to mean a little bit different today, but at its root, it means roundup. And definition of a rodeo is a competition where cowboys, cowgirls, compete in various events involving horses, cattle, uh, during which their skills as a cowboy or cowgirl are tested and exhibited. Uh, and in its more recent version, uh, prizes are awarded to the cowboys and cowgirls who excel in their uh, respective events. When and where the first rodeo actually occurred is debatable. Uh, pretty much every western state has a claim on the first rodeo. Uh, looking at the history books though, Santa Fe has one they claim occurred in 1847. Picos, Texas claims theirs was in 1883, uh, but pretty much in the rodeo world, uh, Prescott, Arizona is given the honor of having the oldest and original rodeo. Their rodeo still goes on today. Their first rodeo occurred in 1888, and the reason it's given the title of the first rodeo was they had established rules, they had invitations out to certain cowboys, uh, they had uh, rules, and they had bronc riding, steer roping, and different horse races. So they were kind of organized. Were there rodeos before that? Yeah, but they were not an organized event per se. It was usually just some cowboys getting together on a ranch somewhere, competing for bragging rights. Uh, <clears throat> following year, Prescott added their uh, steer roping and uh, added calf roping in 1917. Uh, what also contributes to the modern rodeo is definitely the Wild West shows that went on. Uh, Buffalo Bill had one, Pawnee Bill, there were all these Wild West shows out there that had this similar aura uh, of, of horsemanship, competitions, things like that. So, <clears throat> A little bit about rodeo, most people who know it know it of it from what's called the PRCA or the PBR, the professional ranks, but it's, there's different circuits out there, uh, different levels of competition. Um, the map here is actually from the PRCA, which we'll talk about, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. That's kind of how they break things down. But before you can get to the professional ranks, there's amateur ranks. Certain states have high school rodeo competitions. Uh, some have collegiate. There's semi-professional ranks. There's working cowboy ranks. There's cowboys whose sole 
job is rodeo, that's the professional ranks, and then there's even a uh, American Indian circuit, which is separate from what goes on in the professional ranks. So in Kansas and throughout a lot of western states, uh, you have the National High School Rodeo Association. That's where a lot of cowboys and cowgirls really start competing uh, at a higher level. Uh, there are some high school rodeo associations here in Kansas. Uh, we also have the NIRA, which is the National Intercollegiate Rodeo Association. In Kansas, we're part of the Central Plains region, and the schools that are part of the NIRA in Kansas, Fort Scott, Garden City, Colby, K-State, and Fort Hayes. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, a lot of these places have their own rodeos. Uh, Fort Scott often has rodeos, and uh, I don't know how they are this year. I've been out of the rodeo business for a few years now. Uh, they used to be nationally ranked. They would bring people in from all over the country uh, on scholarship, like, a foot, like the schools have football, basketball. Fort Scott gave out a lot of rodeo scholarships, and they had some of the best college riders in the country coming through Fort Scott. Uh, it's kind of hard to see what the lights mean is the way they are, but Fort Scott actually has a large rodeo team. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon for them to have around 40, 45 people on their rodeo team, guys, women, uh, and a lot of them will go on to four-year schools after, uh, <clears throat> after their time there, still on rodeo scholarship and compete. Oklahoma, Texas, Wyoming schools that have the big four-year rodeo programs. There's also amateur rodeo, what we would kind of consider the semi-professional level uh, for cowboys, cowgirls who'd like to eventually compete in the professional circuit, but they're not there yet. Certain rodeos want you to have a certain amount of points before you move on to the professional level, a certain amount of experience. You build up that working in the semi-professional circuit. Um, so a lot of those people work day jobs, they do this on the nights and the weekends, uh, and then average they pull in about ten to $15,000 a year, which is not a lot of money considering the danger and the expense they put out, driving, gas money, wear and tear on their vehicles, because a lot of times you bring in your own horses, things like that. So again, that's for people who either love the sport and know they're not going to go professional but just want to keep competing or they're trying to get to the point where they can get a card from one of the professional uh, organizations to compete. Um, for the working cowboys there's actually a whole nother rodeo circuit. It's called the Working Ranch Cowboys Association. It's out of Amarillo, Texas and the events they do, their focus as an organization is on cowboys and cowgirls who actually work on ranches. So this is in many respects more true to what would have happened in the 1800s. Uh, these men and women aren't looking to go professional. They ranch for a living, but they like to do things on the side, tied to rodeo. They do br bronc riding. Uh, they do an event called team penning, where people will use their horses to get the cows into corrals, things like that. Uh, they do team branding, so you work to get the cow branded. You work to get the team, the doc, uh, cow doctored. That's the team doctoring. And then they do something called wild cow milking. Has anyone seen that? Carly, have you seen no. it? No. Um, no, but it sounds like fun. I didn't know if you saw that out in California. <laughs> Two people get a wild cow. They chase it. One guy ropes it. The other guy holds it in place. The guy gets off the horse, runs over, and milks it. Uses an old glass jug or a bucket to get a certain amount of milk into it. That's over. Is it timed? Is that right? Yeah, it's a timed event, absolutely. Yeah. If you're fortunate enough to even get to the point. Not <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, or even get the cow to the point where you can try to milk it. Because it's going to kick you. It's going to try to be mean. Uh, these are cows that are not dairy cattle, so they're not used to it. These are beef cows. So, you know, other than their, their calves milking them for survival purposes, yeah. They're not used to being milked. Moving up to the professional rank, the granddaddy is what's called the PRCA, Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. Uh, they came out in 1936, and they are the oldest and largest. Uh, 
They're in the U.S. and Canada, and on an average year put on about 600 rodeos, uh, primarily in the western states and the lower Canadian provinces. Uh, last year, their membership included uh, about 4,700 cowboys and cowgirls. So again, it's, it, it runs the gamut of the events, uh, different levels of expertise, but again, all these people have had enough points where they can get to the point where they can ask for a PRCA card, which is kind of like a union, I guess. You get certain rights by being in the PRCA. And how do you get them? By competing and placing, it's kind of like NASCAR, which I don't know a whole lot now at NASCAR, but what I'm going to go with it is you compete at different events. How you place earns you a certain amount of points, and then over the year, or in this case over years, you build up enough points by competing in various rodeos and placing. So you can compete in 100 rodeos but never get any points if you never complete the event. So let's say you're a bull rider, you never make eight seconds. You could have done 100 rides, but you don't have any points to kind of move up the ranks. But let's say you do 100 rodeos, you place first in bull riding all 100 rodeos, you're going to get enough points where they're going to say, yeah, you're good enough, come up. You apply, if you go to the PRA web, PRCA website, they have an, a form you fill out and it lists your history and things like that and then you apply for, for membership. But again, you gotta have a certain amount of credentialing before you can apply to, to get in. On the tails of the PRCA is the PBR, which is relatively new, 1992. Uh, their sole focus is bull riding. Uh, bull riding blew up in the early 1990s. Uh, my wife Chris and I were actually working on our PhDs in Connecticut in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and the PBR was coming through Connecticut and Massachusetts. In the East, people didn't care about the other stuff, but everyone liked the bull riding. Everyone wanted to see bull riding. So Boston, uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Pequot Indian Reservation had the PBR come through. It was big and it still is. If you talk to a lot of the riders in the PBR, they'll say New York and Boston are two of their favorite places to go uh, because they get massive turnout and people aren't familiar with it. They think it's cool. So they're actually like rock stars when they go to cities like that where opposed you're in Texas, you're in Arizona. Yeah, you might be good, people like you, but there's other people who rodeo. You go to some of these eastern cities, they don't get it. Uh, they don't get the events regularly is what I meant. The people get it and they like it, so they turn out. Uh, they're big money. Uh, since they've founded, they've paid out about $160 million in prize money. And some of these professional guys, um, they make big money. They, they make professional athlete money. Um, interesting thing about the PBR, a lot of cowboys don't like it. Uh, PBR gets criticized a lot for not being a true cowboy organization. They're more of an athletic organization. And when you see a lot of the PBR riders in their day clothes, they wear sweatpants, they wear sneakers, uh, they wear Nike t-shirts, things like that. And a lot of the guys from the PRCA or the working cowboy ranks view them more as athletes than actual cowboys. And they don't knock them, they're good bull riders, but they're not necessarily cowboys. They're athletes who compete in cowboy sports, if that makes sense, that, that differentiation. And actually, if I heard the news right, isn't the PRCA in town tonight? Yeah. Where are they up? It's, uh, Hell Arena. Hell Arena? Yeah. Last night tonight. What, what was that? that? Last night tonight, this afternoon, I think it's a bad day. Oh, cool. OK. Um, there's also what we call the Indian Rodeo Association. Uh, there's actually 13 different American Indian Rodeo Associations in the US and Canada. Uh, but they come together once a year in Las Vegas in November for what's called the Indian National Finals Rodeo. And so you'll get the guys from up in Canada, you'll get the Cree coming down, you'll get your Navajo riders, your, your Comanche riders coming up, and they all compete in Las Vegas to see who's the best Indian cowboy or cowgirl. They do pretty much the same events as the other rodeos. Uh, every now and then they'll throw in a specific Indian event, but again, most, uh, mostly what they do is the traditional rodeo events. And a lot of the guys and women who are good in this are in the PRCA. 
So they'll do the PRCA events and then they'll come together in November for the Indian rodeos. So the events themselves, they're broken into two main categories, timed events and rough stock events. Some rodeos often have what also have what's called an all around cowboy category and it's the cowboy who does the best in all the events, the roping, the bronc riding, the bull riding, and at the end of the season, you are considered the best all around cowboy. Uh, it comes with extra prize money, a bigger belt buckle, things like that. Uh, there's a guy named Trevor Brazil. Uh, he has the most titles of all around cowboy, 23 years. So he retired a couple years ago, and he wasn't that old. Uh, but it's like football after a decade or so, in his case, multiple decades, it kind of takes a wear and tear on your body. So what are the timed events? There's a couple of them. One of the more popular ones is steel re steer wrestling. So you start and shoot with your horse. The steer's in the pen. The steer's released. You're released. You ride up next to it on your horse. You jump off your horse grab the steer by the horns, roll it over on its back. Object is to get the steer on its back, get all four legs off the ground. Is that something you would run out of a working cowboy would really have to do? Not real. <laughs> it came from working ranch. To be fair, it's kind of dangerous. Uh, I guess if you are exceptionally mad at a calf or a steer, you may do it. But no, that's what the ropes were for. They don't have to do it to brand it or anything. No, no. Uh, the good guys in the professional ranks can do it in three to 10 seconds. Where it came from, it does have its roots in ranching, but it was a guy named Bill Pickett, a black cowboy uh, from, I believe he was from Texas. If Texas or, Ty, do you know, was he Texican or Oklahoma? Do not know. I think it was Texas. Uh, he worked ranches growing up, and he watched cattle dogs do certain things to the cast and the steers, and he had kind of adopted the practice working in the Wild West shows. So he did it as a form of entertainment. Uh, when he did it, they called it bulldogging. Uh, and one of the things he would do, supposedly in lore, again, we're talking a long time ago, he would bite the ear of the steer or the calf as he did it, uh, to, when he helped pull it over. Uh, and again, he came out of doing it in the Wild West shows. It kind of blew up there and entered into the rodeo arena. Uh, just to put it out there, the steers they use are about 450 to 650 pounds. So in the rodeo rank, some of those guys are the bigger guys. A lot of your bull riders, bronc riders, they're not big. They're slender. They're muscular, but they're not bulky. A lot of the guys who do the steer wrestling, they tend to be a little bit bigger, have a little more heft. Uh, not as big as the steers, but they're still pretty big guys. Oh, in case you don't know, a steer is a castrated bull. So there's also calf roping or what's called tie down roping in some arenas. Um, same idea, calf is in a chute, you and your horse are in a chute, calf's released, you're released. Idea is to rope the calf, dismount, flip it over, and use what's called the pig and string, which is a short rope the guy has in his mouth, to tie three of the legs together. As you're doing that, though, if you've got a good horse, uh, your horse is backing up slowly to keep tension on the rope and to keep that calf uh, kind of help keep it on its back, keep it from jumping up, because if the rope gets slack, it's going to be able to get up and get away, and you don't want that. So a lot of those guys, they actually have their rope tied a certain way to the horn on their saddle, so when it goes taut, it doesn't come loose. It helps keep the calf, calf down. Object, since it's a timed event, do it as quick as possible, and the PRCA guys do it in about seven seconds. So. Again, you got to be pretty strong uh, to run that quick and grab that thing and just pick it up and, and turn it over. This is something that's based more on true ranch life than, than the steer wrestling.
kind of just said that. It kind of came about from working the calves that needed to be doctored and branded. Uh, <clears throat> what a lot of places are doing now is something called breakaway roping. Uh, it came out of the amateur ranks, particularly the college ranks. Uh, and it's where you lasso your calf, and as soon as the rope comes taut, you let it go. Uh, in the college ranks, uh, men and women do this. Uh, you don't see a lot of professional women ropers in the, uh, in the higher ranks. Is that allowable? Yeah, you just don't see a ton of them. Uh, so in this case, your calf's not tied down. The rope goes taut. The calf's let go. A lot of that comes about, to be honest with you, there was a lot of kickback in a lot of rodeo associations that uh, tying the calf up the way it was being done was a little rough on the calves. They were getting hurt, things like that. Uh, so a lot of people backed off to be a little nicer to the calves. Uh, again, you've got a working ranch. That's one thing you're doing it for a sport. Maybe there's a little bit of a different, softer hand that needs to be taken. There's team roping. Object is for what's called a header, the lead horse. To catch the, the steer or the calf by the head, usually around the horns. The healer comes up behind, catches it by the legs, it's pulled taut, the ropes as well as the steer, uh, and then it's released. This would definitely come out of working ranches. As dumb as it sounds, this is actually dangerous. A lot of guys who do the heading they do their rope, what's called a dally, which means it's wrapped around the saddle horn in a certain way, and you pull it, you work it to let it taut and loose. But if you don't do it right, a lot of guys are missing pinkies. The pinky gets caught in the rope, and I don't know if you've ever seen or worked with a, uh, a true rope you would use it. It's a very strong rope. It's wax-coated. It doesn't, it's very unforgiving, and if you get your pinky or thumb caught, it will take it right off. I didn't know if there was going to be kids here, so I didn't put any pictures in. But if you Google roping incidents or accidents, uh, you'll see a lot of men and some women missing pinkies and thumbs from it getting caught up in the ropes. How do they uh, rope the legs? Do they put it in front so they step into it, or they try to time it to get it while the legs up and going? The idea is as the legs are coming up, so the guy up front, the header does an overhead throw. The guy on the, the healer does more of an underhand type throw. And as it's running, you try to time it where the legs are coming up and you hit both legs. So it's a timing event. Uh, there's, it's outside, it's in the kids area. There's a little metal steer and rope. Uh, it, 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 the back legs swing. You can kick it, it swings, and then you can go back and watch the legs go up, and you can practice your timing, and that's what it's used for. You kind of have to get the timing down, and as you become more in tune with your header, that's what makes a good team as well, they can kind of feed off one another and know how he pulls the cow so when the legs are likely to come up as well. Doesn't it hurt the cow? Honestly, it can. The, the mindset is a little different. You know, am I a true cowboy? No. Did I have the fortunate, uh, the, was I fortunate enough to spend a lot of time working with these guys? Yeah. Uh, many years in, in pr primarily Utah. Um, that's kind of how I learned about rodeo. My wife and I spent three years working at a rodeo while we lived in Utah. Um, it, it's a different perspective on life. It's a different perspective on how you treat animals. I knew a lot of guys who had phenomenal horses, but it was no different than a pickup truck to them. It was part of their livelihood. Uh, they weren't pets per se. They weren't, you know, they weren't like the little chihuahua you lit up on your couch. It was, it was a very different perspective. Uh, and that's hard for a lot of people who don't grow up around that to, to accept. Uh, I'm going to run out of time, and I want to get to the better events, in my opinion. Uh, there's a penalty. If you only rope one leg, you get a five-second penalty. 
Uh, in the amateur ranks, you're given multiple chances to rope the steer. Professional, you get one shot, one and done. Uh, if you're good in the, in the professional ranks, six to eight seconds to head it and heal it. Um, I think it's a 60 second limit in most rodeos. If you don't rope it in 60 seconds, you're out. And at some of the uh, certain rodeos around the country, male and female teams compete together. So you could have a male header, a female healer, things like that. So, because to be fair, uh, at least when we were out in Utah and Arizona, some of those women were better than the guys, to be fair. There's barrel racing. In the professional ranks, it's, pro, uh, it's, it's primarily, it's solely women. At the amateur ranks, it's men and women. Uh, the idea is to do a cloverleaf pattern around three 55-gallon barrels with knocking them over and do it as quick as you can. The current record is 13.37 seconds set by a woman named Taylor Jacobs back in 2016. And it's not a short course. It's, it's a big course. The course is laid out. You come in, you go around the first barrel, go around the second, up and down. Uh, there's 90 feet between the first and second barrel, 105 feet between barrels one and three and two and three and 60 feet from the start to finish line. So you're covering a lot of ground in 14, 15 seconds. Missing a barrel is a disqualification. Knocking down a barrel is a five second penalty added to your overall time. 60 second maximum to get around the barrel. You're working your horse hard. Those horses, in my experience, are incredibly babied. They are well taken care of. They are treated well. The riders who do barrel racing really love their horses and take care of them. Uh, rough stock events, they're the ones that people are usually more drawn to, particularly if they're not familiar with rodeo because they're a little bit more over the top. Uh, saddle bronc riding, the, the theory is it came out of breaking horses on ranches. The object is to hold on to a rein made out of a rope with one hand for eight seconds. The riders get scored on a 100-point scale. There's four judges. Two judges judge the horse. Two judges judge the rider. So a total of 50 points for each. What do you mean, judge the horse? The idea is that you as the rider should be able to get the horse to respond in a certain way. The idea also is that you're having good stock contractors bringing good horses so those horses know how to buck. They have an attitude problem. If you open the gate and the horse just walks out, that's not a good bucking horse. So it's, it's this conglomerate of multiple things. Um, the horse, or well, the rider, rides a small hornless saddle it has a cantle and it has a pommel. Uh, the fenders are short on it. So it's really designed to help keep you in the seat uh, or on the horse's back, but it's missing all the frills of a normal working saddle. Um, there's a rein, but it's just one rope. So you hold on to it with one hand, and you do have stirrups uh, that you put your feet into if you want, uh, which you should. Um, and then you hold on for eight seconds and the horse is just going to keep kicking. That's the idea. You hear a lot of people say that uh, in the rodeos, particularly the professional rodeos, this piece back here called a flank strap or a flank rope is tied around the horse's testicles. That's not true. It's anatomically incorrect. You can't do that. What it is is it goes around the belly, and they do pull it tight, and it does piss the horse off. But it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the horse. It's like cinching your belt too tight. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Are you going to want to loosen it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they are loosened as soon as the event's over. But to be fair, most of these horses are on broken horses. They're not used to having people on their backs to begin with. That's what makes them a good bucking horse. And it is dangerous. Uh, as that picture shows, landing on your face, horses do come down on you because they spin sometimes. 
and they're throwing their legs down. A lot of the riders wear flak jackets, uh, so when you get hit, it helps impact the injuries, so you're not blowing out a lung, you're not breaking ribs, things like that. Bareback, same concept, same scoring system. Uh, that's wrong, I made a mistake. It's not supposed to hold on to the rein. You hold on to what's called a rigging. There's no saddle, you're literally on the bare back. That's the rigging. It's a handled device that's strapped around, around the horse's shoulder. Depending if you hold with your left hand or right hand, it'll lean one way or the other, the rigging, and that's it. You hold on to it. No stirrups, nothing else. Your arms taking all of it. The one thing I will say, let me go back for a second, it's clearer in this picture. A lot of the guys will wear a roll collar because your head gets snapped back real bad and bareback. So a lot of guys will wear these collars that help their head from getting snapped back. I gotta be honest with you, I personally think these guys are nuts. You're, no, these guys are nuts. The big event, like I said earlier, that people really go for is bull riding. Um, started out as steer riding, but as people got more into it, people wanted to see bigger, better steers. They moved up to bulls in the 1920s. And even if you look at bull riding, the past decade or two, the bulls have gotten significantly bigger than they used to be. Bull riders wrap a bull rope, which is this fiber rope, around the chest of the bull, right behind the bull's front leg. You tie your hand into the bull rope. You sit on the shoulders. Hope to God you can hold on for eight seconds. If your free hand touches the bull at all, you're automatically disqualified. There's no saddle. There's no padding. There is nothing. Zero is quite a common score for bull riders. The chute opens, the bull comes out, the first thing it wants to do is spin. That centrifugal force, if you're not ready for it, will launch you. Uh, most professionals score in the 75 to 80 range. Anything above 80 is excellent, and there's only been one 100 score in the history of the PRCA, and that was in 1991. Right now in the PBR, the average bull weighs 16 to 1,700 pounds, and the average bull rider weighs a little 170 pounds. If you start to get 160, 170 pounds, you're considered a bull, big bull rider. Uh, one of the best Brazilian bull riders right now weighs 125 pounds. I'm sure it's all about these guys. I love these guys. Uh, I don't think they're as nuts as the bareback riders, to be honest with you. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, what scared me, and this is just my personal fear, those, bare, those bareback horses get so high. These guys, when they throw you, you can be high, but it's, it's, to me it's just a different force when you hit the ground. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I've tried this several times. I sucked. I was horrible at it. But... I would never have tried bareback riding. I tried roping, I tried a bunch of different things when we worked at rodeo. That I tried, I could get into that. The bareback scared me. There was something about it that just unsettled me. Uh, and I have respect for those guys, don't get me wrong, but for me, that was a tipping point. I, could, I wouldn't try that. Now, I've noticed you talk about the blackjacks too. <clears throat> the last few years or several years, the bull riders especially went to blacks and also helmets. Helmets. Yeah, uh, when we were in Utah, people were wearing helmets. Uh, there's a famous bull rider. It was, in, I think, in 2001 out of Utah, and I'm blanking on his name right now. He actually had the horn go through his eye and come out the back of his skull. And he lived. He's riding bulls again. He's fine. But half his face is missing. Uh, and that's the thing with bull riding. A lot of the injuries actually come from you being slammed forward when the bull's head goes back. So people were breaking noses, cracking cheeks bones, losing teeth. So the helmet came about 
a lot of that. People think it's for when you hit the ground. It was actually more for, for that concussive force when that bull's head was being thrown back. Uh, a lot of damage happens there, more than you think. Is there any consistency in the way the bulls act? I mean, do they all come out and spin right away, or is, is and does bull A do the same thing from rodeo to rodeo, or is it all totally made up? They'll have their trends. They'll have the things they tend to do. And when you're in the professional ranks, you study bulls like you study opposing football teams. You because you draw. It's based on a lotto. So when you go to a rodeo, you don't know who you're riding. You'll draw a bull, and that's the bull you're going to ride Friday night. Uh, so you need to know who you're going up against. And people will know this bull will come out. He'll generally go to the right. This one comes out, goes to the left. This one, when he throws you, tries to step on you. This one tries to gore you when he throws you. So you need to know because you kind of have to respond according to who you're riding. The semi-professional guys, their bulls are a little different. Those bulls get rode so much, they kind of have tells and you can kind of figure them out. The PBR, PRCA bulls, they use so many contractors and the bulls are so big and nasty to begin with, you, it, it's a little more difficult. You start though, I gotta throw this out here, mutton busting. It's what the little kids do before they get up to the bigger animals. You start on sheep and you can hold on with two hands. So generally the way it works is they run across the arena. When they get to the end of the arena, the sheep just stop and the kid gets off. <laughs> if they throw you, if you fall off, they don't turn around and try to bite you or kick you. They just keep running. So Farrell, did you ever do that when you were here? Not with a sheep, but uh, steers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the mutton busting is big in the Southwest. Uh, last rodeo I went to up uh, at Kemper a couple years ago, they had mutton busting. They had the little kids riding them. They still do. They still do? Yeah, I don't know if it's during a rodeo or not. They have it back to back in some place also. Okay. Those kids get into it. The little boys get off, they throw their hats, you know, they're, they're all kinds of into it. Want to mention two other things to close this out. There are supporting staff that need to be mentioned. One's called the pickup man, man or pickup men. There's usually multiple of them. Their job is to help the cowboys and cowgirls get off the horses. So like if you're bareback riding uh, and you're holding on, if you don't want to jump off, because a lot of times jumping off, you can actually roll an ankle, sprain a knee, things like that. They'll ride up next to you and you can jump off onto them. And they'll also pin the horse and try to get it to the end to get it where it needs to be. They rope the bulls when they're done. They're like working cowboys and they're there to assist the rodeo riders. They often don't get a lot of credit, but those guys are important and they're usually really good. Same thing for the bullfighters. They used to be called rodeo clowns. Their job is to distract the bull when someone hits the ground. And I have cowgirls because I've seen several women ride bulls. Uh, not in the professional ranks, but in the semi-professional ranks. Their job is to distract the bull so the person can get off. Very rarely does a bull rider land on their feet. Often you'll see them, they'll hit the ground and they'll have to pick themselves up. And you're at a very, what's the word I'm looking for? Precarious. You don't have a lot of protection at that point. So you need someone to draw their attention because if you're on your stomach trying to push up and they come in with their head on the back, you're, they're going to break your back. Uh, I hate to say that. We saw that at one rodeo. We saw someone break his back and uh, he died. Uh, and at another rodeo, we saw someone's head get stamped and cracked their skull. It is considered the most dangerous, if not one of the most dangerous sports in the world. And that's what I was talking about. You hit the ground, they come right in at you. And 1,700 pounds pile driving your face and chest in the ground is going to do damage. Saddle bronc, bareback, and steer wrestling are also high for injuries. And like I said earlier, roping can be dangerous. You can actually use fingers dallying. That's why bull riding is as dangerous as I said. It's your rope. It goes around the belly or by the upper legs. It comes around. You sandwich your hand into it and you tie it off. 
So when you get thrown, you often don't come free. People will get what's called hung up, and you'll see the bull running around, their arms stashed, still stuck in there, and they're getting dragged around the arena, and then you're getting stepped on, the horns are hitting you in the head when it gets ticked off, that can cause a lot of damage. A lot of young riders do what's called a bubble wrap, where they do a loose wrap, so when they get thrown, they can pull their hand right out. So a lot of the professional guys, they cinch it down tight. You'll see them hammering on their hand. What they're doing is they're getting every little bit of play out that rope. The younger guys, when they're starting, they leave it a little looser uh, so you can slide your hand out. Can you wear gloves? You have to wear gloves. Yeah. Uh, you wear a big leather gauntlet type gloves usually and you tie it off with medical tape or duct tape. Uh, to keep your wrist uh, somewhat taut. And a most, lot of bull riders, they also wrap their ankles in medical tape uh, so that when they get thrown, cowboy boots, to be fair, they're not very stable for the ankles. Uh, so if you're not going to wear a boot that laces up, you're going to tie off your ankles too so when you hit the ground, you don't roll an ankle. There's something called Justin Sports Medicine, which is the big medical organization that takes care of guys at the pro ranks. Uh, concussions, facial lacerations, chest and rib injuries, shoulder elbow injuries, torn hamstrings, torn thigh muscles, injured ankles and knees are all common in rodeo guys. Particularly the bull riders have a saying, it's not when you get hurt, it's how bad you get hurt. Every bull rider I've ever met in my life has had serious injuries. It's just how long are they laid up and do they go back to it. Yeah, this guy here, this was from last year at the NFR. I can't remember his name. He hit the ground and the bull came in on him and broke his nose, completely smashed it to the side because the horn hit him. And that's why the helmet's for a lot of guys now. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, I like cowboy hats, but at the same time, I can take it off for eight seconds and, and put a helmet on. They kind of look like hockey helmets, but they're a little more sturdy. How much do they make on this? Like, I know the winners get a bunch of money, but is it gradually to the second, third, fourth place? Or? There's payouts for some of the lower categories, but my understanding is most rodeos, uh, the big money's going to the top four. After that, it's, it's, it's minimal amounts of money, if any. Uh, where a lot of these guys get their money, they're sponsored. Wrangler jeans, Justin Cowboy boots, that's all ha Stetson hats, Resist All hats. They get money to wear their logos, to, to promote their products, things like that. So you can make money from the sport, but you also make it from the sponsorship. Will the sponsors drop you if you never win? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and that was my last slide. Any other questions? You kind of referenced this, but like who owns the, am not the horses, but the other animals that are parts of a rodeo? Stock contractors. Okay. Uh, so depending where you go in the country, there's different stock contractors to PRC, PRCA or PBR will call to bring in bulls, to bring in the horses, to bring in the sheep for the mutton bust in. Uh, so there's contractors who bring that bring that stuff in, bring those animals in. And do they become like sort of commercially useless in some cases after they're rodeo animals? You know, like if a steer gets hurt, is it then? If it was a good, oh, that way, yeah. If it's a bull though, you can make a lot of money off breeding right. to keep the line going. Right. Uh, but yeah, honestly, <clears throat> a lot of times if those younger animals get hurt and they're not useful to the rodeo anymore, they might go to market. So if, they're, if you let it grow up, then yeah, it's going to go to market for, for beef. So. Doctor, uh, you just talked about stock contractors, but the NFR, the Cowboys, I think, the cow, correct me if I'm wrong, the Cowboys vote or somehow the bulls and horses are owned or come from different stock, stock contractors or something. Like they use better stop there, not just one contractor. Is there. Oh yeah, no, there's, yeah, there's multiple contractors. And yeah, the higher up you go, the better the contractor is. Uh, they have good bloodlines. Uh, 
they have good attitudes, the contractors themselves, they take care of their animals. Rodeo gets a lot of flack for being anti-animal rights, and they're really not. The good rodeo ranks are, I can't talk about a backwoods rodeo in the middle of nowhere, that's one thing, but the NFR, the PBR, um, all those organizations, no, they're, they try to do right by their animals. Uh, they, they really do. Are any of like, these professional riders unionized? No, I, just in sports medicine actually has a program. You pay into it, and it helps riders who are hurt. Because if you're a bull rider, you cannot get insurance. No, that's serious. Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, all those groups, if you're a bull rider, you're uncoverable. Uh, and a lot of these guys, particularly the young guys, they break their back, they end up in a wheelchair, and they don't have insurance. They don't have a million dollars plus of medical bills. So a lot of these guys pay into a, a fund. Uh, and then that fund can get drawn off if somebody gets hurt. Right. So. I have a question. I'm going to sound really heartless here, but when I was a kid, I went to a lot of rodeos and I thought, wow, that's, that's a man. And the first time I saw a rodeo where the guy was wearing the helmet and the flak jacket, I thought, where's the cowboy? <laughs> um, and and I, I understand if I were on a bull, I'd want to be protected, but is there anything in the ranks of those who actually? perform in rodeos against those who put on non-cowboy-like protection. Yeah, protections. there are some guys who will tell you point blank, I will never wear a helmet because I'm meant to wear a cowboy. Because I've always wondered about that. Yeah, um, there's people like that and, and they're diehards and then there's people who start out like that, they break a nose, lose a couple teeth, they change their mind. Uh, personally, I don't see anything wrong with wearing a helmet. And uh, flak jackets are law now. You have to wear a flak jacket. Oh, that's um, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, the professional rodeo ranks instituted that. I think it was about 10, 15 years ago. Flak jackets are mandatory now. Helmets are optional. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with wearing a helmet. Yeah, it doesn't have the look, you know. But again, 20, 30 years ago, the bulls were smaller. You know, on oh, average. That's a good point. You know, they were probably, you know, the bulls back then were probably 12, 1300 pounds. Now we're up to 1,700 pounds. The biggest bull in the PBR right now is 20, uh, 2,000 pounds. I, you, you know, you, you got to do what little bit you can to give yourself an advantage, particularly if you want to make a career out of this. You want to have longevity like any other sport. Yeah, you got. I personally think you got to go with the helmet. And yeah, is that less cowboy? Yeah, probably, but there's also cowboys who have trucks with automatic transmissions now. <laughs> Not everyone has a clutch. So, you know, 20 years ago, most cowboys I knew wouldn't have drove a truck if it didn't have a stick. Right. It wasn't manual. Right. So, you know, like anything else in culture. Yeah, I just wondered if there were any there's some. who there's some. who thought that. Yeah. I think, like you said, too, PBR, we, as people, that's like you said, back east, they don't know some of this stuff, but we like to see that action. We don't want to make it hurry. I mean, they sort of don't want to be hurry. Exactly, yeah. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys for coming.